All right, guys, it is an unbelievably spectacularly gorgeous, I mean, over the top beautiful day here in the end times on this gorgeous Tuesday morning. Where are we? I don't know. Maybe March 9th, somewhere around there, uh, 2021. And so the little dog and I, since I have nobody else to go kayaking with, the little dog and I are going to go kayaking into an alligator infested swamp. So, uh, been nice knowing the little dog. <clears throat> and uh, so, anyway, before I head out, just want to uh, share a few quotes from this book Good Dogs Don't Make It to the South Pole. Uh, before I even uh, get into uh, this quote. You, you, you know, I've been thinking a lot, you guys might have noticed, I have been thinking a lot of about fear lately. I don't know why fear has become such a central theme in my life, because it really doesn't play that much a part in my life, but uh, you know, I, I guess I, I just need to be brutally honest with me. The, the biggest fear that I have uh, heading into my golden years, as they call them, I love that euphemism for watching your body and probably your brain starting to fall apart around you while you look on helplessly, uh, as brother Roy was pointing out yesterday and uh, <clears throat> you know figuring out how to get my how to pitch my tent while the sun is already while the sun is still high in the sky while the sun is starting to set and uh, I need to figure out how to pitch my tent and lay the sleeping bags before the darkness settles in and of course the operative word in that sentence is bags sleeping bags plural implying that there's another person beside you uh, in the sleeping bag beside you uh, as darkness settles in and so sorry for the cliche guys but but the single biggest fear I have uh, facing the darkness, what is known as my future, is just facing this shit alone. Uh, as much as I love the little dog, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, I've, I've, how many, I, I, I know you guys get sick of me telling stories about my mama, <clears throat> Elaine Mitchell, and all her wise sayings. But uh, I've mentioned this one before, but it bears repeating. You know, I've told the story about how my mother uh, lived in Atlanta, Georgia from the year, let's see, I believe 1938 till the day she died in 1997. So uh, she lived... <clears throat> most of her life, her entire adult life in Atlanta, Georgia, she never liked Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and she spent her entire life there, you know, raising five children and, and then three grandkids came along and whatnot. Uh, and she always would talk about this dream of buying a place a lot like this. I ended up kind of buying my mother's dream. You know, she her dream was that she was going to buy what she called a fish camp. A you know, just like a where fishermen come and put in their boats. She was going to have a, you, you know, she pictured herself uh, sitting in a little bait and tackle store and uh, probably a little campground, maybe a couple of cabins <clears throat> out in the Florida woods, 
uh, somewhere on the water in Florida. That was her favorite place in the world, were places exactly like <clears throat> this uh, place I have uh, wound up at, uh, you know, here in the Point Lonesome Swamp at the end of this rutted out dirt road. And she talked about this for years. <clears throat> and as she was growing older and older, I would say, Mom, uh, you know, why are you staying here in Atlanta? Uh, you know you need to be buying your little fish camp down there on the water in Florida. And her answer to that uh, was, Sam, it's not where you are, it is who you are with is what is important in life. Uh, the where is nice icing on the cake is great if you can be where you want to be, but uh, she would take being someplace she did not want to be in exchange for being there with the people she chose to be with and chose to love. Uh, this is another way of saying she was terrified of finding herself in a place exactly like I have found mine in this absolutely beautiful paradise at the end of the road uh, and tucked out here in this beautiful waterfront property sitting here with my thumb up my ass totally alone not to uh, insult the little dog uh, y y you know uh, it is not where you are it is who you are with and uh, <clears throat> I had it, 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 it sucks uh, the, these people who say they enjoy being hermits living out in the woods alone maybe they do I am not one uh, but anyway, <clears throat> I should have listened to my mama, I guess, but then I would be living somewhere I don't want to live with, just so I can be with the people I love, but at least I have summertime uh, in, in Bugs in a Jar Farm to be with my friends. All right, I don't know what all that preamble was about. It has something to do with this book uh, by a Norwegian writer, Hans Olav Thivold. Hans Olav Thivold. You might have uh, heard that other guy on that other channel read a few passages from here. I was going to read this as my depressed, collapsitarian whine on Thursday, but I noticed the book is overdue. So I have to get this book back to the library. So uh, before I do, I actually got a nice note from oh, from Hans Olav yesterday uh, telling me he's writing a new book about the collapse. So I uh, can't wait. But this is from Good Dogs Don't Make It to the South Pole. <clears throat> and his... Uh, the woman he lives with is named Mrs. Thorkildsen. One of Mrs. Thorkildsen's old friends, most likely a library colleague, I'd imagine, once put it this way, to be or not to be, that is the question. Sure, sure, if you're going to be that black and white about it, it might look like that's the question, to be or not to be. So black, so white, black as fur, white as snow. But usually life looks more like brown slush in late winter. <clears throat> One trip out of the cage. That's another way you might look at it. You lie curled up in your nest safe and sound. All your needs are satiated and you are at peace. Then one day, the cage door opens, and without understanding why, or really having any desire to do, 
any desire to, you leave life in the cage and wander out into another life. Maybe it's a good life with adequate portions of love, food, and exercise. Maybe it's a sad life with loneliness. Maybe it's short, maybe it's long, but whether you are ordered there or escape there, you will eventually find yourself back in the cage, safe and sound in your nest. A bullet through the skull after a deed well done at the end of a tiring day, or years of illness and decline, more brown slush. Still, what do I gain by fearing even thinking about death? I, who, unlike Mrs. Thorkildson, cannot say that the world has changed much since I was young. <clears throat> I'm not talking about all the daily death traps that must be summarily avoided from atomic bombs to the mailman. I think of the fear that grows so strong it becomes a hunger. I think that may be what happened to Mrs. Thorkildson. <clears throat> If a dog and not a librarian were to make that statement, <clears throat> to be or not to be, that is the question, it would not be to be or not to be, but to be alone or not alone. It is not about many or few. It is about somebody or nobody. It's about not having to be alone when you die, just like it was about not being alone while you lived. A death-defying pack to flank you on the battlefield, or a frightened, arthritic old hand holding your paw while the vet's IV enters your vein. It doesn't really matter, but not alone. That is what matters. Everyone remembers or should remember the space dog Laika for her groundbreaking efforts in the next stage of the human conquest of the universe after Earth had finally been fully discovered with the help of dogs and the ensuing two wars had ended. Laika, too, was the first to make tracks where dogs, not to mention most people, had no business going out into the great unknown. But that's where the similarities end. While the Chiefs Pack, they're talking about uh, Amundsen's trip to the South Pole as the Chief, while the Chiefs Pack went into the unknown with a clear mission and a plan for how to get back with their hides intact, there was no going back for Laika. Unlike her fellow canines, the Greenland dogs, also unable to turn back, this had nothing to do with her race. Laika was a stray from Moscow of indeterminate origin. Laika died weightless and panicked from overheating after a few hours aboard Sputnik 2, but her job was already done at that point. She had involuntarily proven that a person could survive being shot into nothingness with a rocket launcher, and humanity has not stopped doing it since. A wolf and a human <clears throat> meet one day along the road, and soon they're both weightlessly floating in the great nothingness from nowhere to nothing. I suppose that is the logical next step, but again, one might ask Mrs. Thorkildson, what are they doing up there? 
the official story is that Laika was put to sleep after a few comfortable days in space in a humane and dignified way, of course, but that's the thing about the truth. It tends to come to light once it reaches a certain age. It took its time with this one, and not only that, a scientist who had joined the Laika project and later penned the masterpiece Animals in Space, Oleg Gazenko later said, quote, I'm sorry about that. We should not have done that. We did not learn enough from that project to justify that dog's death, close quote. Determining whether the average human being might have a future in space was not a good enough reason to kill a single shabby street dog, according to wise old Oleg. What I don't know, unfortunately, is how he felt about wiping out a couple hundred Greenland dogs to reach the South Pole 15 minutes before the British men. That is all guesswork. But we're going to close with one uh, last quote from Mrs. Thorkildsen uh, when uh, she was talking to her dog <clears throat> about the fear of death. Close this up, Mrs. Thorkelson. I don't fear death, she said, and every time I forget that I don't fear death and wake up small and afraid in the middle of the night, I remind myself that the worst thing that can happen to me right now is a long life. Amen, uh, Mrs. Thorkildsen, and amen, Hans Olaf Feivold. Uh, a long life living alone, even in this beautiful paradise in the point lonesome swamp at the end of a rutted dirt road, that is what terrifies ham bone little tail. So I'm going to get out there and uh, when I finally get these petunias planted, I'm going to get out there on this gorgeous day and try to take uh, Brother Roy's advice and figure out how I am going to pitch my tent and lay my sleeping bags, plural, before darkness sets in over what I've got left of my puny little life. And I highly suggest you get out there and pitch your tent while you still can. Bye, guys.